Hello and welcome to the Grand Line Review, your source for everything One Piece. Today we have a long awaited manga review of chapter 930. Ebisu Village. And getting straight into it, we have some very big news this week, as a certain Charlotte Lin Lin has arrived on Wano, sort of. Well, they, you know, she tried. But I was certainly not expecting the Big Mom Pirates to come into play this soon in the arc. The presence of another Yonko is massive, much more so than I think this chapter made it out to be. But I'm thrilled that it's happened because the idea of two Yonko going down in a single arc is very much approaching reality. With that said, this isn't exactly the way I thought it was gonna pan out. First up, there is but a single ship, the Queen Mama Chanta. And while it is jam packed with familiar faces, I, just like King, am not really sure how the Big Mom Pirates expected this to turn out. It kind of reminds me of Luffy's crew entering Whole Cake Island. A head on approach would have completely crushed them, and it has left Big Mom with a momentary defeat, and a scary one at that, as she has been submerged in water. Very, very dangerous for Devil Fruit users, or so I hear. I mean, I have no doubt that this will be but a minor setback for them, because we are dealing with possibly the most relentless woman alive, but at the moment the Big Mom Pirates just feel so uncharacteristically powerless. I mean, even the supplementary forces we've seen don't exactly exclaim power like Flampe. What is Flampe doing there, of all people? She seems like one of the most useless members of the family that Big Mom could have possibly brought. Meanwhile, it seems like we have but one sweet commander along with us, which definitely contributes to making this group feel quite underpowered. I guess I suppose it's entirely possible that Cracker and Katakuri also got demoted after losing to Luffy, or perhaps they were just deemed too injured to come. Then again, we could have a situation where the rest of Big Mom's forces are currently parked outside of Wano, and the Queen Mama Chanter is acting as more of a vanguard. You know what, come to think of it, we don't see Oven there either. And there's absolutely no reason not to bring him, unless he got taken down by Jinbei or something like that after the Straw Hats left. But yeah, very, very interesting crew composition. I do very much like that it seems that most of the characters appearing now in Wano are the ones that were given such a little focus on Hawcake Island, so that's quite promising. However, all of our old favorites could also be here and just awaiting their chance to reappear. I know that most of us are definitely hoping for some more Katakuri at the very least, but I personally would not be surprised if he was left out of Wano entirely. The biggest question I have in my mind is whether or not Brulee is with them actually. I know that Wano is a nation of older ways, but there surely have to be some mirrors hanging around somewhere, yeah? And given that we're not exactly sure how the limits of the mirror world work, I currently don't see why we couldn't just infiltrate Wano that way. Unless of course she isn't there because her ability is entirely too OP and just can't be in this part of the story. But actually, you know what, even then infiltrating Wano Wano should not have been quite this difficult. Big Mom could have just ridden Prometheus up there, or Perispero could have created a candy escalator or something. There are just so many options with this group of characters. But now we need to talk about the revelation regarding a certain king, who appeared to smack down the Queen Mama Chanta, complete in Pteranodon form. And he looks pretty damn awesome, quite reminiscent of Marco in his Phoenix form actually, complete with flames and everything. Now I'm no dinosaur specialist guy, as you can probably tell from how I phrase that, but I didn't think that Pteranodons were quite capable of generating fire. So I'm thinking this must be a king special here, given that the devil fruit itself is classified as an ancient zone rather than a mythical. It is starting to make me wonder exactly how many of these Ryu Ryu no Mi's we are going to get in this arc though. In two chapters, they've already become one of the most predominant subtypes amongst the Zoan fruits. Currently, the record to beat is a series of four, which is held by the group of devil fruits known as the Inu Inu no Mi, in which we have a wolf, a dachshund, a jackal, and as of recently, a nine-tailed fox. Although I suspect that the deeper we go into Wano, the more dinosaur dinosaur goodness we may be privy to. Interesting thing to note about King though, it's heavily implied that Big Mom, Perispero, and possibly even Compot know who he is because their reactions are very different from the other showcased reaction coming from Mont Dor, who was quite surprised at the idea of a Pteranodon, and come to think of it very knowledgeable in the field of dinosaurs to instantly have recognized a Pteranodon, rather than mix it up with say a pterodactyl like <laughs> I think I might have when I first saw the panel before reading the description box. Then again, I guess Mont Dor does have access to a hell of a lot of books. In any case, my point is that only only the oldest of the children seem to know King. Moving on to the next key part of the chapter, we have more dinosaur action, setting up a soon to be conflict with Sanji and page one. He was able to take a kick from Sanji quite comfortably, so hey, it looks like we finally have a decent headliner to go up against. Excellent. But with that said, I'm really loving the confidence that Sanji has put on full display here at the end of the chapter. He seems to have sized up page one fairly well after that kick and still believes that he can win with relative ease. And hey, as a result, so do I. Although I think the real X factor here is going to be the raid suit. I love that Sanji is planning on using it as a disguise, but I can see a situation where he puts it on and then has absolutely no idea how to control it, leading him to either accidentally defeating page one or retreating. Then again, I think there may also be another possibility. At the moment, we're all very much assuming that this 
this raid suit will be similar to that of the rest of the Germa. But how amazing would it be if his siblings had given Sanji a suit as a joke? And when it transforms, it dresses Sanji in a completely stupid outfit, like a cute fluffy animal or a magical girl, still retaining all of the inherent powers of a raid suit, just designed to make him look like a complete weirdo, and to possibly spread yet another strange legend on the island of Wano. In either case, I'm pretty damn keen for what's to come. And now we travel all the way back to the beginning to spend some time with Zoro and his new best friend dude. And in fact, the location in which the two end up in is actually where the chapter takes its title. So Oda giving a little hint there that this place must be a bit more important than at least I seem to think. Everyone in this town has a very familiar character trait though, being that they always smile, even in the face of overwhelmingly horrendous situations. I mean, I think one of the citizens is even smiling while saying that he's dying of starvation or something like that. But putting two and two together, this is surely the village that Toko is from, yeah? Toko being the Komoro of Komorosaki, who we met recently, but I'm not going to lie, I completely forgot about her during the three week break. So it took a lot longer for me to tweak that these people also had her character quirk than I would like to admit. And speaking of twigging to things, Yasu, he has to be the witching hour boy, right? I'm just struggling to assign him any form of relevance at the moment. And it just seems awfully suspicious, what with him being dressed like a stereotypical Japanese thief. Oh, and the whole, oh Yasu, you missed it. The witching hour boy visited us last night. So look, all I'm saying is, have we ever seen Yasu and the witching hour boy in the same room? Because I sure haven't. As for exactly why we're spending time here in Ibisu village, I'm not really sure. But it is nice to see another side of the citizens of Wano, a group of people dealing with these troubles in their own unique way. And it even got a heartwarming moment out of Zoro. Well, you know, as close as you can get to breaking that impenetrable stoic wall. Oh, and that reminds me, my favorite moment of the chapter was undoubtedly when the villager physically forced Zoro to smile. Whoever that person was certainly has no fear, but they did give us a fantastic panel. But that pretty much does it for chapter 930. Sadly, once again, we have a break next week, which is, you know, just how January works. But soon enough, we'll be back in the proper swing of things and ready to jump into 2019 proper. If you enjoyed this video and the content this channel produces in general, then please do consider donating to the Grand Line Review Patreon, because the support of all of you amazing people is what continues to make this channel possible. Also, do check out my Teespring store if you're interested in shirts, hoodies, or other miscellaneous items, with the proceeds going directly to support the channel as well. And if you'd like to join the fun at any time, then please do head over to my Discord server, where a wide array of shenaniganry takes place on a daily basis. And finally, please do comment with your thoughts on the chapter. This has been the Grand Line Review, and I'll see you next time.